Pray with me, will you? Heavenly Father, one and true, God of grace and mercy, we come to you now in prayer knowing that you hear us. And we ask that our prayers might be consistent with your divine plan and purpose. We're so thankful for the many blesses, blessings that you have, you have granted us, you've bestowed upon us. May we be mindful that our lives are a blessing to others. Thank you, Lord, for your constant care. And we pray for those in our midst who need it a lot right now. We acknowledge that you are the God who provides all our needs according to your riches. And may we rest in that promise. For you are a great shepherd. Lord, would you provide for us in a way that enables us to be used by you for your glory, for your kingdom, for our pleasure, divinely inspired pleasure. Give us antennas so that we might be able to identify opportunities to witness in our words and our deeds and give us strength towards these prayers. Watch over us, Lord, as a people, your church in the world, your witness. Protect us. Grant us your mercy. Fill us with your grace. Grant us great peace and fulfillment from following you wherever you lead us. May we sense your presence and power. Now, Lord, we ask that in these next few moments that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all these hearts might be pleasing to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're diving deeply into the Ten Commandments. And we're on the first commandment. I looked at the sermon title and someone pointed out that if you use a little creative punctuation, if you put the word by after the word sermon in a comma after one and only, it makes it sound like sermon by the one and only Reverend Randy Carstens. That was not my intent. <laughs> but somebody, you're clever. You're very clever. This commandment is about who's the boss. The one and only boss. One of you was telling me a couple of months ago about, about when he got fir first got married, he went to his wife and, and he said, I want you to know that I'm, I'm the one that's wearing the pants in, these family, in this family. I'm the one wearing the pants in this family. And his wife said to him, that's fine, but I'm going to tell you what color to wear. I told you I was going to use that in a sermon. <laughs> you know, who's the boss in your family? You know, I think the boss, you know, is the husband is the wife. And I think a lot of times the boss in person's family is their pet. You know what I mean? The pets kind of control things. Like I think little Jerry Seinfeld is the boss in our family. I have to put him in a sermon about once every four months. But, you know, excuse me, I know you're getting ready for church, but I have personal needs. So he's whining at me this morning. Or maybe he looks at me and as if to say, you're sitting in my seat. Would you please move? Or I want to go, Whatever. Who's the boss? Today we're going to talk about the boss of the world, the boss of the church, about our boss. How do we answer that question? Who is the boss of our lives? He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now sometimes, you know, it's easy to think that God is, you know, some distant, all-powerful, ivory tower cosmic deity who made the world and now he's somewhere and he's just throwing out these edicts and these commands, these rules to keep us in line. He's going to whack us upside the head if we get out of line just a little bit. That's the kind of boss some people perceive God to be, but he is not. We've read in the call to worship, what we've read in our, in, in, in sung in our hymns this morning is this fact that God is personal, that God is present, and that God is unchanging. That's the kind of boss we have. We had a family friend who passed away a couple of years ago, and he was very successful. He rose from being an office boy in a utility company in, in, in back in Louisiana all the way to CEO. And everyone knew that he was the boss. Passed away, and the day of his funeral, I was in the, in the procession, and the road to the cemetery passed by the company's office. And as we pulled around to turn into the cemetery, every employee in that office was lining the streets. They had been waiting for an hour in the afternoon sun to show their appreciation, their appreciation for him. 
It's amazing. You know why? Because of the relationships that he had with them. He knew the people. And the people knew him. Even after he retired, he would regularly come back and visit, not to make sure they were doing their job, but just to say, how are you doing here? How are you doing there? I was thinking about this for you. How is that going? Everyone from the, from the, the, uh, the, the, the office boys and part-time people and line workers all the way to the execs, they knew that he cared. They knew that he was there and they, they felt valued. He, he, this friend of ours wasn't a distant ivory tower boss. His leadership was personal. And he was present. And his employees knew that. Is God personal to you? Is he involved in the world? Is he involved in the lives of his children? You know, sometimes people forget that Christianity is not some impersonal rule-keeping religion where we're duty-bound to not get out of line. The very essence, if you think, the very essence of the gospel is personal. Highly personal. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to spend time with people, to spend time in this world, to spend time with us. And by welcoming him and by believing he is who he says he is, the Bible says he gives us the privilege, the right to become children of God. That's a very personal thing. In this passage, if you look at it, the whole chapter, it's filled with the phrase, the Lord your God, who brought you, you know, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Then later, I tell you, know, the Lord your God, over and over, the Lord your God, honor your mother and father so that your life may be long in the land that your God is giving you. So the first idea in this passage is this. God is no ivory tower boss waiting to club us whenever we step out of line. He is with us. It's a personal relationship with God. Second idea is this. You know what? Man will find something to worship. Why? Because we're made that way. We are incurably religious. Someone once said that there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man. They cannot be filled by any created thing but can only be filled by the creator. You see, God made every man and woman and child with a longing to know him. We're made that way. He fashioned us so that we would find our greatest enjoyment in him by enjoying him. There's no greater enjoyment. Sometimes we don't see that, do we? I happen to have a dollar bill here. You know whose picture that is? It's Washington, I believe. On the back, it's kind of a clever thing. It says, in God we trust. In God we trust. Now, what I wonder is this. It's a great phrase, but I would just wonder, who is the God that the people trust these days? There have always been a lot of so-called gods. Every culture has its idols. Back in Israel's day, every nation made up their gods. And it's not that different today. Mankind has no problem in finding or creating substitute gods that seem to be more immediate, that offer things like satisfaction and pleasure. We have no trouble finding substitutes to try to squeeze into that vacuum, that God-shaped vacuum in our heart. It's called substitute worship. In fact, John Calvin made this observation. The heart is an idol factory. What's an idol, you ask? That's what this passage is talking about. An idol is anything that a person values that causes either a person to live or go against the designs or the commands or the promises of God. Causes us to disobey. Some people make their body an idol. And or, and, an idol is something or someone or a feeling, whatever it might be, that competes with one's affections for God. That's what an idol is. Goes against God's design, God's demands, God's promises, or competes with one's affection and attention for God. We have modern day idols that aren't really that different from how they were way back in way back in Israel's day. Like power for some people is an idol. You might be familiar with Elijah and Baal. 
Baal was an Old Testament God of power. If you know the story of Elijah, he took care of Baal. Or pleasure. If it feels good, do it. That's not a new phrase. That's not an advertising catchword. You have the freedom and the right to pleasure. There is an idol named Ashtaroth who was worshipped as the god of pleasure. And he was worshipped by means of all kinds of sexual immorality. For them, their body worshipping Ashtaroth was whatever gives them pleasure. Or prosperity. Syrian god, Mammon was his name, was the god of money. Isn't that funny? That rhymes. How about the the god of play? How about the god of leisure? The word Nike means victory. Play. Look at our culture's fascination with sports. Look what Sunday has become. I mean, how many SEC fans, their happiness in the fall rests on the performance of their team? I've been guilty of that myself. I didn't even go to an SEC school. Easy to have idols. See, creating and worshiping idols all along, it's selfish and straightforward, and it's all too normal back then. Same way today. Man tends to take things naturally and make idols out of them. We all do it. The question is not, do I have idols? The question is, Lord, show me the idols in my heart so that I can lay them at the foot of the cross. Even Egypt had their gods. And the problem with Israel is no different from the problems that anyone else has. It's not that Israel didn't believe in God. It's just they added the idols of the other cultures that they got involved with. And what happened was, is that it watered down, when you do that, it waters down your relationship with God, the true God. And that leads to spiritual bankruptcy if it's allowed to go unchecked. And I wonder if what's true then is still true today. I wonder how easy it is to claim God, yet live after other gods. It's kind of like this. If you go in our church office, you'll see a mailbox. It's a box in there. You know, you've seen it. It contains about 30 slots for mail, and each slot has a name, like an elder's name, or, or a person of responsibility, or an area of responsibility. There's one for me. There's one for the pastor. There's one for the finance, worship, missions, check requests, whatever, bills to be paid, elders. For many people, our lives can get like that mailbox. There's a slot in there, in our lives. There's a slot for for, for leisure. There's a slot for health. There's a slot for finance. There's a slot for relationships or family. Maybe there's a secret slot that we go to that nobody knows about. Oh, and there's a God box there too. There's a slot for God because God is important. I'm a good Christian, so I'm going to have me a God box. And what happens is we tend to plan our time and give our talents and write a check to those various boxes, whatever it might be. You know, uh, uh, whenever this, we want satisfaction out of this box, leisure, pleasure, we grab it. Whenever we want satisfaction out of that box, whatever it might be, we reach in and we grab it, and then we go on with our lives. Oh, and we have a box for God, and we call on Him when we need Him. But he's equal to all the other boxes. And I think that's the point that God's making here. He's saying, worship me and worship me only. I made you to worship me and worship me only. Israel back then, and this box thing idea, if it made any sense, could be called the religion of God and. You ever heard that? God and money. If I want to be happy, I need to have God and power. I need to have God and pleasure. God, I will live my life and I'll call you when I need you. And sometimes, and it happens to everyone, I'm no exception, ministers can make ministry an idol, actually. Sometimes blessings and rights easily become idols. That's that's been my experience. I bet yours too. This passage is saying that God is not just another box in our lives. So in these verses, God is reminding us But this God and religion is a no-no. It's an either-or. You'll have no other gods before me. 
It's an either or. Years after this, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other. I am the Lord your God. The word Lord is the word Yahweh. It's the name that God gave Moses. I am that I am, complete, full, eternal, self-existent. There's nothing more. I am all that I am. It means self-existence. No beginning, no end, infinite, eternal, all, the one true God, the boss, God and only God, not people, defines who he is. All throughout Scripture, from Genesis 1, there's the understanding that there's only one God. In Isaiah 46, for example, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. And Jesus in the New Testament says, no one comes to the Father but by me. That's not limiting. Well, it is limiting. But it's very gracious that there is a way to God, that there's a person that provides a way to God. Jen, Wilkins, Jen, uh, Jen Wilkin writes this, the first command is more than a prohibition against worshiping lesser gods. It's an invitation into reality. Why should Israel worship no other gods before God? Because there are no other gods. So the second idea in this passage is this. There's only one true God, and he is personal. Now this command, and a lot of these commands seem negative. No other gods. Do not steal. Do not, they seem negative. But in every command, especially this one, there is a very positive, wonderful positive. And one of the reasons that he gives these commands, this one in particular, is that he is inviting us to get to know him, to get to know who he is, to get to know what he's like. I have a question. If I were to ask you, why did Moses lead the people out of Egypt? You know what I would say? You know what most people would say? Because he wanted to take them to the promised land, right? He wanted to take them to the promised land. But if you look at this account in Exodus, I'll give you one example. In chapter five or uh, chapter seven, he goes, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Why should I let my, your people go? So that they can worship God in the desert. Another time he asked him, let my people go so that they can have a festival of worship in the wilderness. That's what Moses said. So then why would God have Moses lead the people of Egypt through the Red Sea just so that they could worship in the wilderness? It doesn't seem to make sense. The reason is, is because they needed to get to know the promiser before they entered the promised land. They had to get to know the blesser before they could really enjoy the blessings. They needed to know the one who delivered them so that they could live like delivered people of God that he called them to be. <clears throat> Perhaps if they entered the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land that's so rich in blessings, without knowing the promiser, maybe that promised land, they would forget the promiser and all of those blessings would turn into idols. Because the blessings that are there every day that they're experiencing could be valued above the blesser. But what's true back then is also true now. It's true for us. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. There's a reason this command is put here first. Because this command is the foundation to all the other commands. I mean, think about it. The other nine commands, tick them off in your head. Speak of acts. Honor your mother and father. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Don't steal. Don't lie. Acts. This one speaks of how we relate to God, of his worth to us, of his worship moment by moment in our lives. He is one and only. And he's inviting us to know him, to find our chief satisfaction in him alone. And he's saying nothing ever comes close to knowing me because I am the one and only. 
So he deserves way more than a slot in our lives. He deserves the whole thing. Now, following the Lord is a high calling. We fail. But an excuse us just magnifies his grace. It's a tall order to follow God. It's not easy throughout history. It's always been easy for man to settle for less to get what we want. To consider less to be more than what God says is more. Sometimes we settle for less thinking it's more and we don't even know it. So then as we think about this and as we wind up this message, how does a follower of Christ follow the first commandment? Well, let me suggest some ways. First one would be this. Gratitude and gratefulness to God. Now, God is our Savior. but God's our Deliverer. That's what He's done. And when we read, He says, no other gods before me, what He's literally saying is no other gods before my face. In other words, if you're coming, if, if, if I'm present with you, I don't want any other gods in my present. It does not help you. It doesn't hurt me. I'm always going to be God and I'm unchanging. So what does it do for you? He doesn't need our worship. We need to worship him. Before my face. Remember, when Adam and Eve first sinned, what did they do? They, they, they hid from the face of God. They hid from the presence of God. We ask, what does that have to do with gratitude? What's going on with this, this idea? What are you talking about? Well, this verse is implying something very powerful. It's implying something that's, that's very wonderful. It's saying that wherever you are, whatever you have going on in any moment, God says, you have me. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, however crazy you're thinking, whatever knucklehead actions you're doing, you have me. The God of the universe. I am the Lord your God. We have the only one who can make promises that seem so outlandish sometimes and yet keep them. He sought you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he has bought you with the price of his son. How do you know? How do you know? Because if you believe, if you trust, not in some shaky idol or some made-up God, but in the one true God as best as you understand him, He's covered the complete shortfall of our failures to keep his commands and even to think of him rightly. And he covered that shortfall with his son who abided in every way and died in our place for our failures to honor and worship him. Gratitude for him. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our trust. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your savior and the one you seek to follow, you can rest assured that God had a hand. God brought you there. He's your delivery from slavery. Slavery of a life apart from him. So that's the first thing. Gratitude. I'm so thankful for what he did. For who he is. And I think the second thing is a heart of repentance. We think of this word repentance. It's like a church word. But it's really just an everyday word. Heart of repentance means being a willingness to change our minds. Being willing to change our direction. Being willing to realize, hey, you know, maybe that's an idol in my life. I need to turn from that and turn back to the Lord and claim the forgiveness that's already mine. When a person comes to faith in Christ, that involves repentance. It involves turning from trusting in one way or another in ourselves or something else to get to God and relying on Christ to get us there by faith. And we live our lives as followers of Christ by always maintaining in our hearts the desire to repent where we need to so that we can draw closer to him and please him. That's the second thing. Gratitude, a heart, a willingness to change our direction to follow him. And then finally, spend time getting to know God, the one and only, through the word and prayer. Find out what delights him and ask him, Lord, give me a delight for the things you delight in. That helps. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. This is the Lord who brought us out of the bondage of sin. It only makes sense that we have no other gods. 
because they're not even close. Not even close to the one and only. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you that you made it possible to know you. And I pray that that would be actualized in even greater ways, that we might connect to you in ways that maybe we've never connected to you before. That you would increase our gladness for knowing you and seeking you and serving you. Lord, would you do that for us in the power of your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.